Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rich Weinfeld, and I am a lifelong special educator who um, worked 30 years in the public schools uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., Montgomery County, Maryland, and uh, then the past almost 17 years as a special education consultant, also known as an advocate, where I now am the executive director uh, for a group of 15 special education consultants, and we help families with special needs kids all over the D.C. area, as, as well as sometimes uh, in other parts of the United States as well. So 47 years in special education, and I have to say the past two years have been the strangest, the most difficult, and I think we all know why. No, none of us in our lifetimes has ever seen anything like this pandemic and the impact on our kids, on our teachers, school staff has been enormous. And there is a lot of uncertainty, of course, about what happens next. Um, we're moving into a time where schools are opening uh, in most places. Um, we don't know for how long. We don't know if it'll be, you know, in, in school education all year long. Um, and uh, this year will certainly have a lot of challenges and questions. And that's what I want to unpack a little bit today is how do we think about helping our kids. Um, I'm going to give a very brief presentation based on the three questions that uh, were advertised as, as part of this uh, webinar today. I love the format of these webinars, uh, ask the expert, and, and um, I really wanna leave the majority of the time for us to have a discussion, uh, hear from you, your thoughts, and uh, interact with you uh, to do my best to answer your questions. Um, before I dive in, I want to thank Trish and I want to thank Chad for uh, inviting me today and just for all the work they do to get information out to parents and teachers about uh, best practices for kids with special needs. So as I think about kids returning to school, I think about three distinct areas that all relate to one another. One is what is the child's progress on their individual plan, whether it be an IEP or a 504 or even a more informal plan that doesn't involve an IEP or 504? So how are they progressing? Second is to look at what's happened very carefully over the pandemic and um, both in terms of how they progress, but also are there new challenges? And we're seeing many kids with um, where their educational disability that they may have always had is more evident um, at this point because of their struggles. We're seeing more kids with anxiety, um, social skills challenges because of their time away from school. So we need to carefully look at all of that and I'll, I'll speak more about that. And then the third area is, is the most important. What are we gonna do about it? How do we create a meaningful plan um, so that uh, students can get back on track to the, to the most extent possible. So let me unpack each of those things a little bit and then I'll stop and take your questions. So first, um, schools are developing uh, what's called in some places recovery plans, in other places it's called compensatory services, some places it's, uh, it's both, um, but, but I guess the big picture is schools are to develop plans about students who have disabilities and develop plans for returning them to, to school and working on the gaps that were created during this past year and a half or so during, uh, during the pandemic. So in order to, to make a meaningful plan, first of all, we need to know what the child's progress is on their existing goals. IEPs did not stop during the pandemic. 504 plans did not stop during the pandemic. So we need to know what, what was the child's levels of functioning, reading, writing, math, social skills, executive functioning. What were their levels of functioning before the pandemic? What progress did they make 
during the pandemic and where are their levels currently? And so what, what parents and the professionals that support them can do is really carefully review the plans that were in place before the pandemic, or whether it be an IEP or a 504 or a more informal plan, look at what, what grade levels was the student functioning at before the pandemic? What were, what were his or her report card grades? What were the comments that teachers were making about their progress? Also, if the child's involved in any kind of um, therapies in school or out of school, what kind of uh, progress uh, were they making at that point in their speech services, in their ADHD coaching services, in their occupational therapy, whatever, whatever the service may have been? And then um, we might want to uh, also get any an updated assessment to know where is the child functioning right now. And that assessment is something the school could do at no charge, um, or it's something parents can pursue privately. I also think it's a good idea for parents who were the, pers the people who were most involved with the child's education while they were involved in distance learning. It's important for the parents to give a, a summary of that experience. Um, doesn't have to be a long report, might be bullet points, but how, how, how able was the child to access their instruction? Where did they succeed? Where were they challenged? Uh, what are the parents' concerns of what they saw during the virtual learning? So that's the first area, progress on existing goals. Second area I think is important is, are there new areas that resulted from the pandemic? So as I said, many of our kids are experiencing anxiety or symptoms of depression, understandably, from what they've been through. Um, we, we may see more problems with social skills as kids have been more isolated and not had a chance to interact with friends or practice social skills uh, in any kind of meaningful setting. Um, we may see that kids are more distracted than they were uh, a, a year and a half ago. So whatever we're seeing during the pandemic, we want to, to have, again, the parent input that tells us what parents think happened during that period. Um, we want any professionals who may be involved with the kids inside the school and outside the school also to give us their best thoughts about um, what the challenges may be for the kids at this moment as a result of their time in the pandemic. And the result of that is going to be kids who already had an IEP may need additional goal areas and services because a child maybe who had reading and writing goals might now need social skills goals because of, of their challenges that have now emerged from their lack of exposure to social interactions. Um, a child who had a 504 plan may now qualify for an IEP because they may now need specialized instruction to, to close the gap in areas of reading, writing, math, or the more behavioral functional areas, areas of social skills, executive functioning, social emotional coping. Those all might be areas where instruction is needed when before the pandemic, we thought accommodations were enough. And that's really the, the salient uh, difference between the 504 plan and the IEP. In my mind, the IEP comes with specialized instruction, whereas the 504 plan usually is, is based on just accommodations. So what, what areas might they now need specialized instruction in? And is, that, is a, an IEP warranted? And then there's gonna be kids who never had a 504 or IEP before the pandemic, but for whom we've seen challenges come up during the pandemic. And, and now we see that there is an educational impact to those challenges, and they are now going to need a plan that either provides specialized instruction through an IEP or, or accommodations through a 504 plan so that they can, um, have access to their learning and close any gaps that developed over the pandemic. And that, that leads to the most important part in my mind, which is creating a meaningful plan. 
whether we're calling this a recovery plan or compensatory services, what is the plan going to be that is really going to help the child to get back on track with making the progress they should be making? And remember that that progress is really the key word in the world of the IEP. We had a Supreme Court decision a few years ago called Andrew F E N D R E W, which said that the the key that we need to be looking for as to whether an IEP is adequate for a child or not is is the child making progress. So after this one and a half year um, interruption in education, what do we need to do so so those kids are again making progress? And um, for a 504 plan, the the main word there that I think of is access. 504 plan gives a student with an educational disability access to the general ed instruction. Well, after this interruption in their education, what do we need to do now to have a meaningful plan so that they truly have access to their education? So again, what, what do parents and the professionals who support them need to do? They, they, we need to make sure we have recovery plans that address all the needed areas, including the areas that existed before the pandemic, but now with the addition of areas that we're saying are needed because of the pandemic, we need to have specific measurable goals to address any lack of progress. There needs to be a specific timetable that we're agreeing to with the school that we're going to set this recovery plan in place and how are we going to know whether it's working or not what are what are the targets that we're going to be looking for to achieve when are we coming back to review it and see if it's working to see if it needs to be changed tweaked so that it truly works for for this individual child so those are the those are the ideas that is kind of my sharing of my thinking about the return to school at this point and the importance of crafting a meaningful recovery plan. Um, we have a court-appointed uh, court special advocate volunteer, a CASA volunteer that is joining us. His name is Ed. And um, he's new to um, IEPs and um, Section 504 plans, and I know that's a uh, long explanation, but could you just give a, a brief intro to we, what each of those are and um, what, they, what they do for a child with ADHD? So um, I don't know how brief I can be, <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but I will try because I, I'll start by saying uh, I've written uh, I've written a book on this topic called the Special Needs Advocacy Resource Book, which um, also has become the basis for a graduate level course. Um, that's a three credit course, so it's so it's not a uh, quick quick topic, but I'll do my best to reduce it to what I think are the basics of each plan. So. Um, First of all, it's important to know, 50, you hear about 504s and IEPs in the same breath together all the time, but they're really very different. They are the products of two different laws and really with two different focuses. So 504 plan is, is really a, a civil rights law. It's a, it's a law that makes sure that the rights of people with disabilities are, are not being overlooked, that they are having the same access to public programs that people without disabilities would have. And, and access is the key word here. So we think, we, we look at a child and, and or an adult, and in the case of a 504 plan, the 504 plan can last uh, the person's entire life because it's not education specific. But we look at the person and say, you know, what is the disability? And we have to define that disability and we have to uh, verify that it exists. Does the disability substantially limit a life activity? And we say a life activity that could be concentrating, thinking, reading, performing a certain job, walking, 
eating. It could be any any life activity, really. And the, the law contains examples, but they're not meant to be exhaustive. So does does the disability substantially limit the person's uh, ability to do that activity? And then if so, what are the accommodations we can put in place that allows that person access? And accommodations, I think of um, a, a physical accommodation would be there's a, there's a curb that is uh, at a sharp angle, so a person in a wheelchair can't get over it. We put in a curb cut so the person can get up onto the sidewalk. That's, that is a, a, an accommodation. In school, the accommodations are things like having the child sit up front in their class, providing them with extended time. Um, providing them with the uh, ability to hear a book rather than read it. Um, uh, teacher check-ins to check for understanding, and the list goes on and on, but they're all accommodations typically. Let's move over to an IEP. An IEP is an educational, is a product of an educational law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And here we're again looking at children with disabilities, school-aged children with disabilities, and we're determining what specialized instruction do these children need in order to make progress. And again, the key word is progress when we come to an IEP. Keyword for 504 access, keyword for IEP progress. So with an IEP, we're we're going to start off in the same place as the 504 plan. We're going to look at what is the disability, and the federal government and the state governments have defined approximately 14 different disability areas. Typically, for a child with ADHD, that would fall under the area of other health impairment. So it's one of several health impairments which could qualify a child for an IEP. Um, so once we determine the disability, we then look at what are the child's present levels in the different areas that are important to the school day, reading, writing, math. Hopefully we also look at executive functioning, social emotional coping, social skills. How's the child functioning in those areas and is there an impact in any of those areas where there is some needed specialized instruction? So where we determine that there is a need, we then draw up goals and objectives to target progress in those areas. Child is below grade level in reading fluency. So we, we use perhaps an evidence-based reading intervention to help them to make progress in their reading fluency. A uh, child with ADHD is behind in their executive functioning skills. So we set aside some time in the school day to teach them how to improve their executive functioning skills. As opposed to a 504 where we're asking the teacher to check in with them, remind them about their homework, but we'll still have those accommodations in the IEP, but we're also trying to have them improve their skills, progress, maybe get to the point where they don't even need the accommodation because they've, they've made progress. Um, the IEP then comes with specific services that, that are the outgrowth of those goals. So a certain amount of time a day is usually serviced by a special educator who's teaching the child some of these skills that may be holding them back. For some kids, it results in a change of their placement, even for part of the day. So, so maybe for part of the day, they're going out to a special classroom to get some service. Maybe the special educator's coming into the room. For other kids, their least restrictive environment may be that they're moving to a separate classroom in the school all day long, or even a separate school in the same school district where their appropriate services are available, or for a small percentage of kids, even out of the school district to receive uh, education at school system uh, expense because that's what's needed in order for them to make progress. Um, so those, that's, that's the, uh, the five minute version of the three, three credit graduate course. <laughs> um, as a follow up to that, we have another 
uh, CASA volunteer um, who has said that and uh, they are having difficulties getting support for children that are on the cusp of needing services. They don't fit into the severe need, but definitely require accommodations. And they're asking how can they possibly um, do a better job of supporting them? That's what we're doing every day and, and advocates across the country are doing. It, 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 it is a, um, I'll say that often reasonable people can disagree about whether the child is experiencing impact or not. So for the, for the 504 plan, the standard is, is, is what's happening substantially limiting the child? What does that mean? It's hard to define. You know, as a parent or an advocate, we might say, yes, they're substantially limited because they have to have a tutor outside of school and they, it takes them hours to do what other kids just take a few minutes to do outside of school and they're, um, they feel lost a big part of the time. The school might look at the same student and say, they're earning C's, that's passing grade, that shows they're making progress. So reasonable people can disagree and it's up to us as the children's advocates and with a small a because I think parents are advocates, lots of different professionals are advocates. So it's up to us as, as the advocates for the child to to really help explain the experience of the child and how this is impacting them, if, if in fact it is. Um, and that, you know, that requires gathering data and the more um, specific data we can present to the school team, the more convincing we're going to be. So we want to document how long is it taking the child to do each of their assignments in the evening um, what is the child saying about their school experience? We, we, if there hasn't been an assessment that's been done on the child, that is a great way to document what the impact is. So yes, this child may be getting C's or B's in school, but this assessment may document that they are in fact behind in certain areas that need to be addressed. So, so getting an assessment can be extremely important. Getting a um, letter from a treating physician uh, or psychologist or other uh, related service provider that talks about what they see, all that is data that can help drive the decision uh, in the school meeting. And that, that's what I would strongly recommend. At the end of the day, if, if we as advocates are in disagreement with the school team, I'll include parents as, as part of the advocates, if we as parents and advocates are in disagreement, there are dispute options. Um, and those are part of the 504 law and part of the IEP law. And we shouldn't be afraid to pursue those dispute options to get what the child needs. I, I was in a um, mediation yesterday that was discussing whether a child should be retained for a second year in eighth grade, which we, the parents and I, thought was necessary after the pandemic and his lack of progress. The school system didn't see it the same way, but after discussing it in mediation, we reached agreement and he will be retained. So that wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened if parents weren't willing to dispute what the school system was saying. So don't, don't take, everything you're being told initially at face value. You don't have to be adversarial, you don't have to be hostile, but you do have to be persistent and keep advocating for what's best for the child. Um, the next question comes from Dee. Um, she asks, what are your thoughts on the hybrid learning plans made as additions to the IEP, not in lieu of, but to be used during hybrid or remote learning? Is there specific language that you would recommend? I won't and can't say whether uh, whether hybrid learning plans are good for, for kids in general or, or not. All of this always goes back to the individual student. Is it working for this individual student? And you know, for many, for many of our kids with disabilities, 
um, distance learning has been a disaster. They have not been able to make progress looking at a computer screen, listening to a teacher who is not in the room with them. I will say for some other kids, it's been a blessing. They've, they've flourished. They've liked not having the distractions of the classroom. They've liked being able to focus. So we really have to look at, at each individual child. And, and again, going back to my opening uh, remarks, you know, where were they before the pandemic? What's been their experience during the pandemic? Where are they now? Have they made the progress that they should be making? Um, in terms of language, I would just encourage all of us as advocates for kids to make sure the plans are individualized to address each child's individual set of strengths and challenges, and that we're not um, giving up on accommodations a child might need, goals a child might need to work on, just because we're not in school. We are, we should be thinking creatively, um, thinking what's out there that uh, might be an online uh, course that might really fit for this child. What, what uh, accommodations can we do given, given the virtual environment? Um, for example, a child who needs a lot of one-to-one -one check-ins we can certainly do that on online. Uh, we can have a staff member check in with them individually, even during a, a general ed class. There could be times when the child goes into a chat room with an individual teacher to check for understanding, to reteach things that needs to be retaught. And this is, again, not a one size fits all. This is just an example. So, so the key thing is to look look at the individual child and uh, what do they need, make sure it's provided, and then evaluate, is it working for them? Um, as you are probably aware, a number of parents realized during this time that their child had ADHD or has ADHD, and they got them diagnosed. So they're coming um, to back to school. <laughs> Um, and requesting a 504 plan. So what are some of the things that they should expect and what accommodations um, maybe should they be discussing? Maybe they noticed, for example, that while they were working at home, their child was um, able to do things in a certain way. So maybe they could recommend that to teachers, for example. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um... So I love, you know, the suggestion you just made at the end of that question, which is, is that what parents learned as their child's educators or their child's support staff, however we want to think of it, during this past year and a half or so is crucial for the, for the school team to understand what worked, you know, what worked and what didn't work. And, and let's, let's put that into the plan. Um, there are kids who, you know, clearly have benefited, as I said, from being on a computer to, to receive some of their instruction. There's some wonderful, high-level, creative, interesting instruction available online. For some of our kids uh, with ADHD, that is a, that's a great um, tool for part of their education. So that's, that's an example of something we might advocate for. To start from the beginning, though, you know, coming out of coming out of the pandemic, returning to school, and now asking for a 504 plan because the child ha has been diagnosed with ADHD, and the first the first thing is to really come with data, meaning what were the specifics of that diagnosis? How was it determined? I think that we're going to face some skepticism from the school in terms of not not mean-hearted skepticism but skepticism in terms of well every child had problems during the pandemic every child was distractible every child turned off their camera sometimes because they didn't want to be in class every child avoided instruction i think we're going to hear a lot of that that it was hard for everybody and we just have to kind of pick up where we are and go forward but the fact is that there are children with legitimate ADHD and other disabilities that do need 
a 504 plan or an IEP. So, you know, we have to be prepared to, to articulate, you know, why this diagnosis is a real diagnosis and it's meaningful and um, this, the accommodations in the case of an I 504 or the specialized instruction in the case of an IEP are needed. And I, I, I do want to underline that a lot of, I think too often we think, well, every child with ADHD should be in the 504 bin and the IEP is for other disabilities. And that's not true. If a child has ADHD, they can qualify for an IEP under the category of other health impairment, which then allows for goals to be object to be developed in any area, including reading, writing, math, certainly executive functioning, social skills, social emotional coping skills. So think about think about does my child with ADHD need to have some accommodations? to be successful, or do they need accommodations and specialized instruction? And that would push you more towards the area of advocating for an IEP. Um, what are, okay, so a parent is, uh, you know, has realized that their child has ADHD, they have gone to the doctor, they've gotten the diagnosis, and they're going to the school, and they're requesting accommodations and testing. What is the school's obligation to you and your child or to the parent and the child um, as far as getting testing and, and listening to the parents' concerns? Yeah. So the first the first step um, is for the school to review the existing information, which might include the diagnosis from a private provider. Um, but doesn't have to, and, I, and that's an important point. Parents can come because they suspect their child has ADHD and they don't have a diagnosis yet, and that's legitimate also. But um, at this first meeting, the question is, do we, both parents and school, suspect that there is a, um, an educational disability here? In, in this case, we're talking about ADHD that limits the child's um, educational opportunities. And parents do need to remember that a child could have ADHD, could have a diagnosis for ADHD, but still might not qualify for a 504 plan if we can't show and if the school doesn't believe and there's no data to, to show that there are there are substantial limitations that come from that ADHD, so that that's the that's an important part to keep in mind is is what what are the limitations and and again they could be in things like concentrating, thinking, could be in more school based uh, traditional activities like reading, writing, math. But there, there really are any life activity, and it's a wide, wide area of possibilities. So, so definitely consider consider all of those. Um, another important part about the identification that is sometimes misunderstood is many kids with ADHD are on medication to help them with that, and it's up to the school. And the law is clear about this to think about what would the child's performance be without the medication? So not just looking at this medicated child they have in front of them who seems to be attentive and is not disruptive, but looking at the information the parents are bringing that led to the diagnosis, that maybe also includes a history of what was happening before the diagnosis that um, shows what what is the child likely to be like without the medication? Because we never know when a child might not be able to continue medication because of side effects or just personal choice by parents or the child at some point that they may not continue. What would you recommend for parents who are being told by the school district that all students have regressed? So their student's regression doesn't constitute a need for specialized instruction. 
what again we have to we have to provide data so we have to look at where the child was before the pandemic where are they now and did they make expected progress it's a much easier standard if the child has an iep already um, because the federal government from the outset of the pandemic was very clear that special education is not stopping. So students' rights in the special ed law continued during the pandemic. So this wasn't a year and a half off or a year and a half where we just didn't expect much. The law is that we still had the same expectations for children's progress during this past year and a half. So that that's kids with an IEP are are protected. Not that there won't be pushback, but they're they're better protected against schools saying, well, it's just all kids have reg regression, and what do you expect? And we're going to do our best. Um, you know, kids with 504 plan, I, 504 plans. I think it's a little bit of a more difficult standard. What what you would be looking at there is did the child have access to the instruction that happened during that period of the pandemic um, and that's going to cut that access you, you the parent are the primary witness to how much access did the child really have to that instruction during during the past year and a half but again part of the data is going to be did they progress or not did they um where were they before? Where were they during? Where are they after? And and do we see that they they made some progress? And if if we didn't, along with the parents' reports that you know they were not able to attend to task, they were not able to follow through on tasks, um, they really didn't get their 504 accommodations of somebody checking in to see if they understood, somebody breaking things down into small chunks. Um, whatever those accommodations may have been that were not really provided, then then I think um, you as a parent of a child with a 504 have a stronger case. Um, and then the third group of parents would be the ones who do not yet have a 504 and IEP, and there it's going to be more you're trying to make sure your child is identified for an appropriate plan so that in the future they can close the gap. Um, what support do education specialists offer for children with autism and ADHD who need to develop social skills? So there are many, many wonderful um, groups that are, are um, conducted by speech language pathologists, social workers, psychologists, that help students to, to learn the rules of social skills and to practice them with other students. Um, what I would look for as a parent is a, a um, program that is evidence-based and provided with fidelity, meaning this program has been studied for the population it's being offered. Let's say a elementary school student with high-functioning autism it's been shown to be successful. There's data to show that. And this practitioner is has been certified to use it and they are going to be providing it in, in the way that it was tested and shown to yield uh, this positive evidence. So it's not enough to say I'm doing the PEERS program that is evidence-based from UCLA and we know it works with kids with high-functioning autism. We want to know that they're doing the peers program in the the amount of time that should be given, the amount of frequency that should be given. So things should should have a scientific basis to them, and you, you as a parent should be able to ask that question and see the the data that that supports that. Um, there are folks in the schoolhouse who can do these things as well. Um, so so again, the speech speech pathologist, the psychologist. In some schools, the social worker, the counselor may be trained in evidence-based interventions for kids and may provide just as good an intervention as a private provider would. Again, same questions. We want to know 
what they're using, how they know it's effective, what does the research say about it, how are they trained and certified in it, um, how will they pro be providing it according to the standards that um, the program was designed for. And then the last category of educational specialists I'd like to address is, is my, my category, which, is, which are um, advocates or special ed consultants. And I think what we can do to help is to help parents either access those programs in the school, make sure it becomes part of the child's IEP or, chi or something that they have access to through their 504 plan, or even through an informal plan, but make sure that the child has access or um, help parents to connect with the community providers that are the outstanding providers that, that are certified in these practices and can make a difference for their child. We have uh, time for just a couple more questions. Um, and I want to acknowledge we have a, a ton of questions from um, a number of parents here that are very specific. And um, I'm trying to uh, ask questions that are pretty general so that um, we can be helpful to everybody. Um, for those of you, I just want to make a, uh, give you a reminder that if you have uh, specific questions regarding IEPs and 504 plans, and uh, we are both here, um, Mr. and the CHAD staff are here to answer those specific questions um, after the webinar. So if you want to follow up and send um, me an email, um, the, uh, you can send me an email at, um, I'll type it into the question box um, um, at CHAD and then I can forward it to the appropriate individual. And, and uh, Keisha, if you don't mind, I'll just say that um, I also encourage people to go to my website, Weinfeld Education Group. Weinfeld is W-E-I-N-F-E-L-D. And there's contact information there. And I am happy to uh, have people email me with specific questions as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the first uh, of our last two questions is, um, say the a, a parent or teacher realizes that maybe a Section 504 plan is not appropriate. They maybe suspect that there's some other issues going on that an IEP would address. Um, what sorts of um, conversations should be had and assessments should be made if you're thinking that that might be a better option um, for the student? Again, the critical question in my mind is does the child need specialized instruction in addition to the accommodations that they may be getting through the 504 plan? Do they need something beyond the instruction that all kids get in the day during the day? Do they need more when it comes to learning how to improve their executive functioning, their social skills, social emotional, reading, writing, math? Um, the conversation should be that if anyone suspects that a child has an educational disability which requires an IEP, they, they have a responsibility to refer that child to the school's eligibility team, which is sometimes called Child Find, it's sometimes called an IEP team, sometimes called a multidisciplinary team, but there's a responsibility for any adult um, who, who's working with this child, including the parents, to refer the child to this team for consideration of an IEP. It is, it's crucial that parents, when they suspect their, their child needs an IEP, it's crucial to put it in writing. I can't tell you, how many times I've heard from parents, well, I talked to his teacher about it, and she even agreed that he needed an IEP, but then nothing happened. Once you as a parent write a letter to the school, and it could be an email, doesn't have to be a handwritten letter, and all you have to do is use these magic words. <laughs> I suspect my child has an educational disability, and I'm requesting an IEP be developed. I suspect my child has an educational disability. I'm requesting an IEP be developed. 
as soon as the school receives that email or that letter, the time clock officially starts, legal time clock officially starts. And the school must then convene a, a, a formal meeting to, to discuss, do they agree that there is reason to suspect a disability and to go down the road of developing an IEP? Do they suspect it? That's the first, first hurdle. If they suspect it, then what, what uh, assessments need to be done to determine yes or no to eligibility? There may already be assessments, so it might just be reviewing existing assessments. Often there's additional assessments that need to be done. There's a timeline for each of these steps, and it's legal, and it must be followed, and it, it within, uh, in most states, within 90 days, there has to be a determination, is the child eligible for IEP or not? And then if they are eligible within 30 days after that, there must be an IEP developed. So all of those timelines, 30 days, 90 days, they all start with that parent letter or, or a school person referring the child to the IEP team, which unfortunately does not happen as much as, as parent referrals, but it should. You know, parent school folks should also be referring children as well. So um, that, that would be how to, you know, what should happen if there's any suspicion, even if you're not sure, you don't have to be sure, but if you suspect that your child might have a disability where they would require an IEP, you should write that email, write that letter. It doesn't hurt. An evaluation doesn't hurt. In fact, an evaluation helps, even if it doesn't result in an IEP, helps you to understand not only your child's challenges, but your child's strengths so you can work on developing those strengths as well as trying to remediate the challenges. Well, it looks like we have covered all of our questions. Um, Mr. Weinfeld, is there anything else that you wanted to cover before we wrap up for today? I guess I'd just like to underline this, the last thing I said. You know, so much of our time is spent on worrying as parents, and I'm a parent too, worrying about our child's challenges. And, you know, it, I, I've learned in 47 years that it's even more important to identify our, our children's strengths and to help them build those strengths. So I encourage parents and the folks that help support them, spend some time paying attention to the strengths as well and how can we help that child to realize their unique potential by building those strengths.